Dynithium crystals? They're a sort of crystal color. <laughs> oh, they're like ice. Just give me an opening. Just give me an opening. I guess we really should have uh, somebody in the production department to respond to that question. Uh, I would think that since triples were extremely popular, that uh, <laughs> they will be back in some shape, form, or another. <laughs> well, that's one thing they never showed on the Enterprise was the uh, agricultural department. You see, they never showed it, and uh, but uh, they'll probably do it in the future. All right. We, we, grew, we grew all our own food. Sure. Other exotic looking pets. So actually, they were regular dogs, but they're made up with the horns on them and then uh, purple fluffs on them. But uh, I think there was one segment where we had the, the exotic uh, creature and that transported off. Yes, and it died. It died. Remember? Uh, yes. Yes. What? What, what about Gertrude? Yes. Yes, what about it? What was it? It was really fabric and some plastic. Yeah. <laughs> it was really quite well done, wasn't it? Any other questions? <laughs> Uh, well, I think I got it. Uh, you asked about the view screen and whether there's anything on there. Well, when we're really sh actually shooting it, uh, the uh, screen panel isn't even there because the cameras have to be there to shoot us. And uh, the uh, shot where the, the view screen is uh, seen, uh, it's just a shot of the view screen, and then the uh, pictures, the images are put on by special effects later on. Yes. Around, so I, I, Unfortunately, it's a little... I think we'll have to steer at. No, it, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, it ne uh, never went down on the ground because it uh, was uh, much too expensive in uh, matter, matter, and matter uh, uh, dry. Uh, it doesn't, uh, isn't really uh, workable when it coming down to the ground. They, actually, the uh, ship was built in space and parts were sent up from San Francisco. <laughs> okay? But it was, uh, it was all built in San Francisco, but it was sent up in, uh, uh, by uh, impulse. <laughs> Very okay. impulsive shit. Right. <laughs> oh, <there's... laughs> uh, any of you here know the theory of concupiscity? Nobody knows. Eh? No, yeah. Well, that's what makes matter and that matter drive the ship. <laughs> It really doesn't matter. <laughs> yes. 
Yes, he does, but we won't let you know until you get the show revived. <laughs> All you've got to do is keep writing, and then we get the show revived, then we get his name. So keep writing. <laughs> Well, who wrote those two? <laughs> yes? I never knew it. I didn't know it. Oh, Privately. Well, uh, whoever sentimentally uh, kept them, we don't know who they are, you know. But uh, we have uh, no idea. Most of the uh, sets were uh, given to uh, University of uh, California in uh, Los Angeles, UCLA, and uh, they kept them for about a year, and then uh, they destroyed them because they needed the space. All right. Yes. You can't. Well, thank you very much. Uh, there is a, a woman who had uh, started one, but uh, I'm afraid she's been a, a bit remiss uh, in California. And so in England, uh, Jenny and Joanna are starting one here. And uh, I'll have to talk to uh, Cora Cox, who's, uh, who's uh, in charge of uh, the United States version of that. But. Uh, you might get in touch with her. She lives in, uh, in Anaheim, California. Uh, while you're here, please announce the name of your new friend, Oh, um, all right. Uh, they decided to use my Japanese middle name, uh, the name that means the village of the bountiful heart. <laughs> Hosato. That's what the, the fan club's going to be called here. And I'm really very appreciative and grateful to uh, Jenny and Joanna for uh, getting this started here. I think it's well launched here. Yes, in the, in the back as soon as we can hear. Uh, uh, I would like to ask you, enjoying transportation. I'm sorry, there's no way we can hear. <laughs> if you have a uh, quiet voice, you must bring your question up closer. Did we ever feel nervous uh, about being transported? Well, that's what I said. Did they ever feel nervous about our uh, molecules uh, being uh, tra transported and uh, nervous about it? No, it uh, didn't really uh, bother me. You know, every now and then you uh, go into bits and pieces anyway. <laughs> it feels kind of good. It tickles a bit. <laughs> oh, that was a wicked sounding. Thing. Don't start. Don't start her off, George. <laughs> She's going to blow, Captain. <laughs> she blew. <laughs> the only, I'm, uh, I'm always very happy that uh, I never had to say, Lar, she blows. <laughs> All right, what's next now? Oh, come on. I've known him so far. Say, oh, wow, what's that to drink? Beyond on Antares, work back to three, sir. <laughs> remember. Well, there are people who know every line of every script of Star Trek, but we can't remember them at all. Is that all right now? Because that's all I can do. 
<laughs> you like that? Does that give you the tickles? <laughs> Yes, uh, I can. Uh, I guess the um, most memorable ones uh, in, well, all of the uh, conventions in uh, America have been very large, enormous conventions. The uh, largest, of course, uh, are the ones that, uh, that were held in uh, New York. I think this year they got 15,000 people out. So there's a real difference between uh, uh, the American conventions and this one. I think... Uh, this has been probably the pleasantest convention. It's given us an opportunity to meet most of you personally and chat with you and uh, get to know some of you quite well. And I think that makes it, uh, uh, for us, very, very, very satisfying. So I enjoyed it very much. And I must say that uh, I uh, were very grateful to the uh, hospitality that you shown us and the warmth and friendliness made it very pleasant for us and I want to thank you for making it a very fun weekend for us. I can't remember whether it was at the uh, Detroit convention or the Equicon. I guess it was the uh, Detroit convention that uh, I had two armed Klingons who uh, I mean, had great, enormous uh, phasers, you know, Klingon phasers, and uh, were all dressed up as Klingons, and uh, they were my bodyguards. And uh, when I had to get from one place to another, they just spearheaded me right through, you know, because uh, through maybe two or three thousand people, which has to be done sometimes, because, you know, you have to keep it on schedule, or schedule. All right. Yes? Robin. We don't have the time to tell you, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it works. Uh, it works uh, exactly on the uh, um, time warp uh, principle. You know, <laughs> you know. I don't really. I mean, it works on the time warp principle because otherwise you uh, you have to be able to uh, go quicker than uh, than ordinary uh, electricity. You know, on the speed of light, you have to be able to do it. So. What uh, actually happens is that you build up an, uh, uh, the uh, matter antimatter drive, and it's kind of like a little message that is sent in a, a block of magnetism, right? And uh, but it is sent at warp one thousand, and uh, because it is strictly a magnetic uh, center, you know, it is just flat there and goes at warp one thousand, which is super fantastic <laughs> when it comes down to speed. All right. I guess I shut him up, eh? <laughs> I had back there. I'll have the engineer feel that one too, since he responded to the other one so well. You want an answer like uh, Robin had, or do you want uh, what was uh, what happened on the set? No, that was uh, all done by uh, the optical people and the phaser. When you see that beam going out, that was very expensive, you know. That was, done after everything else is shot and the film is edited and uh, then we send it to the optical people they also put the sparkles in uh, on the transporter um, and uh, but to put that beam of the phaser in at that time probably now it's two and a half times the price of that was a hundred dollars a foot you know and uh, it takes very little time for a foot to run on film but every time you saw a beam from a phaser uh, that cost the production company one hundred dollars for just one foot of, of that on film one foot of film that's done by the uh, Howard Anderson company who are supposed to be the best in uh, and also they are the people who put uh, the uh, shots on the on the uh, the view screen that's also done by opticals all right yes um, talking about the criticism of us uh, when the uh, Enterprise was uh, hit by something, uh, by uh, photon torpedoes uh, from the Klingons or some other uh, thing of us uh, being uh, knocked about and thrown out of the chairs and, and so on. Um, actually, it's uh, that sort of thing is, is terribly uh, difficult to do, and uh, I personally didn't like it. 
I would rather that we all just sat there in a in a stunned way, you know. But uh, action is uh, very important in film, uh, and anything action, uh, even on the stage, is very important. And uh, you have to do something, you know. And uh, uh, unless they uh, rigged up the seats so that we uh, were bounced about on like on the spring, you know. Um, it's uh, it's very difficult. You have to have some kind of action, there, you know. Whatever happened? Whatever happened to Janice Rand, uh, old uh, old Rattan here, right? Um, what was that? It was Rattan? Uh, basket weave hair. Um, well, um, no, she uh, was uh, let go. As a matter of fact, I was seeing a play at uh, university uh, one night, and she told me. She said they dropped me. You know, and uh, I didn't know why, and I don't think anybody really knows uh, why. It's just that uh, for some reason or other they decided that they uh, didn't want uh, another female who may be a, a, a love thing for uh, Captain Kirk. Uh, maybe that was it. I don't know. You know, could be. Oh, she's still locked in Kirk's cabin, eh? Uh, she's uh, what they call a uh, a closet something. <laughs> oh, maybe they don't understand what that means. <laughs> what tartan is it? Yeah. It's the Scott tartan, which is a, a, a as I understand, uh, the uh, Scott tartan is one of the four original tartans uh, of Scotland, and uh, when I asked them, uh, you know, to uh, get me a, a, a kilt. Um, then they uh, had to send up to a place in San Francisco and they sent over to Scotland and uh, then it was sent back to San Francisco and uh, made in San Francisco and then sent down um, to um, the head seamstress or the designer, you know, Bill Tice and the head seamstress was Joy Tierney and uh, she organized the whole thing and her husband is a real Scotsman and he is also a fabulous uh, uh, mechanic of English and other imported cars. And uh, he is my mechanic. And uh, he's a great guy. And, of course, she's a lovely woman. And she has been uh, doing uh, the Doris Day show and uh, all sorts of things. She's uh, always in great demand because she's fabulous. Oh, I had uh, a few... Uh uh, occasions a couple of times, I think. Um, I don't remember the the segment, but uh, there was a quick affair in the corridors once. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yes, they were. <laughs> yes, yes. Question. Do we enjoy all the traveling around we do? Um, Yes, it's very nice, uh, you know, uh, not just uh, uh, with uh, Star Trek conventions and so on, but in a way I have uh, sort of decided for myself that uh, I will let my business do all my traveling for me, you know, because uh, I have not yet been to the uh, islands in uh, Hawaii. And uh, I just figured, well, one of these days, probably within the next two years, I'll uh, get a job in Hawaii and, and then... Uh, you know, it's uh, kind of fun. Also, of course, I go on some of these uh, pro-celebrity uh, golf matches, and uh, I've been to cities that uh, I would probably normally never even go to uh, on vacation with, but I get to see them. You know, I've been to Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, Huntsville, Alabama, and uh, places like that, and I've been up to uh, Seattle, and, you know, done different lots of them, Cincinnati. 95 degrees and 95 humidity, walk out of the plane and hit a wall of water. Oh. I love traveling. I, I guess that's what uh, I share in common with uh, Sulu. Uh, I think, you know, the opportunity to go someplace and meet uh, different people, uh, see different lifestyles, experience, experiencing them yourselves, and uh, to um, see different kinds of building, architecture. I think it's really... Uh, uh, one of the things that uh, make uh, living exciting and worthwhile. And to know that on this planet we have such uh, 
such a great diversity and and <laughs> by travel one can really truly and personally experience that so I think it's great I love it and uh, this opportunity to come here and visit with you in Leicester uh, I, I find uh, really a fantastic uh, experience I really I really enjoyed this weekend very much Yes, I can. I, uh, can he speak Japanese was the question. I've yes. heard him. I've heard him. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's been able to uh, detect my American accent on my Japanese, I'm afraid. But uh, uh, I did go to uh, summer school in Japan and uh, had the chance to uh, uh, perfect it there. I, we had a, a grandmother living in the house, so I had the, the chance to use it uh, daily. And uh, I grew up in the Mexican neighborhood of uh, Los Angeles, and so uh, I speak uh, a little Spanish also. And I enjoy that language and that culture very much. Yes, yes, sir. Speak some, speak some Japanese. Oh, uh, speak George, some Japanese. And, and, and trans translate it for me. All right, please. I'll say... Um, I, I had a grand time here, and uh, I look forward to having you visit us in America again. Uh, handicap oh it's terrible because I never practice no actually I would if I uh, really got out and practice I would be a very good golfer I know but uh, I don't really I don't practice like uh, you know I was up in San Francisco for 10 months so I didn't do a bit of golf I didn't practice or uh, anything else but I get out and practice before I go to those uh, pro celebrity uh, tournaments you know and uh, but you get out there and all they want to do is uh, just see you and they don't care what you do but uh, I remember that a uh, time when I, when I went on my first one, it took me <laughs> took me seven swings to get off the first tee. <laughs> but uh, then I went to Huntsville, Alabama, the second time, and I hit a beautiful shot, you know. And uh, Lee Trevino was there, and uh, he said, he says, "Oh boy, he says, what do we got here?" You know. But uh, the next shot wasn't so good, <laughs> so he lost his fear, shall we say? Yes. I'll tell you what, I haven't had too much uh, opportunity to see uh, British television programs except uh, the ones that have come into the United States. Uh, you mean uh, me, uh, us watching them here? Well, no, but I, I think the uh, plays like the uh, Foresight Saga and the uh, Six Wives six wives of uh, Henry VIII were just fantastic programs, you know, and they really were went over and terribly bigly, uh, bigly. <laughs> in the States, you know, yes. Uh, no, I'm not uh, uh, much of a martial arts uh, uh, weapons uh, collector. Uh, uh, my own personal collection, I have uh, a mask collection. I guess that's the actor side uh, in me. I have uh, masks from uh, uh, Africa, from uh, the uh, South Pacific, the Oceanic area. Uh, some Indian masks and Ceylonese masks and some Japanese uh, antique masks. Uh, uh, I guess I'm basically a pacifist uh, and I, you know, uh, collecting firearms and things like that to me seem a bit uh, barbaric. Well, and the way you the way you wield weapons, uh, <laughs> George, you should be a pacifist. <laughs> I'll pacify them all. <laughs> If you ever go out, if you ever go out hunting, you know, with a shotgun or a rifle, uh, don't go with George. <laughs> all right. I'll take my fencing ball with me. <laughs> Very poorly. <laughs> Robin, You're just gorgeous. I guess I have never had. Ah, oh, but I'd love to have it though. All right, yes. Oh, kendo, the Japanese uh, fencing. Yes, yes, I uh, I did a Hawaiian eye a uh, long, long time ago, many, many years ago, that required uh, 
I do Japanese fencing, and uh, I took some kendo lessons from uh, a master who happened happened to be living in Los Angeles at that time. Yes. Well, Jeffrey Hunter played the um, captain in the first pilot. As some of you may know, there were two pilots made before uh, the uh, show sold the series. And uh, the first pilot was made with Jeffrey Hunter, and apparently uh, the powers that be at both uh, Paramount and uh, NBC felt that he wasn't quite uh, appropriate for the role, and so they made uh, a second pilot with Bill Shatner in that role, and that's what uh, sold. But of course, uh, a great deal of money was invested in the first pilot, so they resurrected that and uh, uh, spliced uh, pieces of it together and made that two-part of it, you may remember, as uh, Menagerie, right. He's, he passed away, uh, I think, about th three or four years after that particular pilot was uh, shot. Rather untimely death. I think he, he fell off. He, he had a heart to something. He, he, something. he fell, fell, down, fell downstairs there. or something. Yeah. 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 Yes, I did uh, a pilot uh, uh, some time ago called... Uh, the House on K Street, a uh, detective uh, type thing, and I was uh, the uh, uh, lab scientist who works with the detective. Uh, it didn't sell. <laughs> <laughs> and I did uh, a couple of pilots which weren't sold, too. And, uh, pardon? Well, I was a uh, ship's officer on uh, aboard a, a ship, uh, which, and that we, uh, there was actually aboard a uh, uh, a British uh, ship that was bought by the Japanese to be destroyed. And uh, as a matter of fact, I just uh, mentioned it. I remembered about it uh, in an interview I had this afternoon about 2.30. And uh, it was there was a Japanese uh, engineer on board who was uh, planning the destruction of the ship. And uh, an American engineer on board who uh, was uh, there to keep the engines uh, in tip-top shape uh, because um, the, it was going to uh, go across to Japan under its own power. and uh, But if we had uh, sold the series, they would have uh, brought the ship down to Long Beach Harbor in uh, Los Angeles and uh, would have uh, gradually done some destruction, uh, you know, on like one side because we needed uh, the corridors and, uh, and everything else, you know, to, for the uh, film if they had sold the pilot. But one uh, gorgeous experience uh, to me, <coughs> being sort of engineer-minded uh, and anyway, was that uh, the uh, two engineers took me uh, on a tour of the ship and I went down into uh, see the engines and so on, but the greatest thing was... Uh, going into the uh, refrigeration room because the ship was about a 40,000 ton uh, passenger ship but also was used in the uh, England uh, to Australia and, and back uh, with meat uh, and so there was a lot of uh, refrigeration uh, there and uh, we uh, one of them looked to the other and said should we start one because there were four engines uh, that ran the refrigeration uh, unit and they it, they acted as if they were in a cathedral, you know. And uh, and the other one said, yeah. So they started this engine up. Well, you couldn't hear it. You couldn't feel it. And the both of them just, and I must say that I uh, went along with it too, they were so impressed with those engines because, uh, and of course, naturally, I think the, uh, the British people who built them were very impressed with them too because they were the only parts of the ship that had to be returned to England once the rest of the ship was destroyed because they said that those engines would run uh, for a hundred years. You know, they were so beautifully built and uh, it was really a fantastic experience to, to uh, hear or not to hear, <laughs> feel or not to feel. Oh, I can't. Re I can't remember now. I, I, uh, that was done in about 1962 with uh, Walter Pigeon and uh, somebody else. He was the captain, and I was one of his uh, officers. I can't remember, uh, dear. <coughs> yes.
I most certainly would. I think the question was, if we had the opportunity to stay in England and work, would we uh, uh, grab that opportunity? Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I may be back in London before too long working on a play. I just uh, finished the television version of a play that, that, that had been running off Broadway in New York uh, called The Year of the Dragons. Uh, it sounds like a kung fu uh, story, but it isn't. It's uh, the story of a uh, Chinese-American family in San Francisco, California, and uh, uh, tells the story of this uh, writer growing up in this Chinese-American family. It reminds me somewhat of uh, uh, Eugene O'Neill's Long Day's Journey into Night, and I just completed the uh, television version of that in New York, and there seems to be uh, c uh, some interest in doing the play uh, on the West End and uh, there's been some feeler on uh, whether I would uh, be interested in doing it here. And of course, uh, I love that city. It's my favorite city. And to the idea of working and living in London is to me a delicious thought. And I certainly will avail myself of that opportunity uh, if that uh, project should uh, come about. And I feel the same way. And there's also a possibility that the play that I was doing in San Francisco could be done in the West End. So, you know, possible. Yes, we should be able to handle the basics involved at almost every station. But, of course, the, uh, the person assigned to that uh, certainly has to be uh, able to do more than just the basic. Uh, that person is the specialist at that. Oh, indeed they are. There was a question there. There's only Scotty going to look after them, too. <laughs> yes? Do we find ourselves what? Oh. Well, in many ways, uh, the world uh, represented by the... Um, uh, crew of the uh, Enterprise uh, was supposed to be symbolic of the world today and uh, sometimes commenting on uh, what's happening in this society today, sometimes uh, criticizing it uh, and sometimes uh, uh, offering uh, an alternative uh, to what might be happening today. So if uh, the uh, world today was definitely the bouncing off point for the society depicted on uh, Star Trek. Uh, in many ways, I thought we had a much more desirable society in, uh, uh, on, on board the Good Ship Enterprise, and of course that's the ideal that we all should uh, strive for. Hopefully we'll get there. I hope not in 200 years. Jimmy, you have a comment on that? No, I, uh, I agree with that. I think that the, uh, just exactly what you said is that the, the uh, ship's crew was, uh, and I think this is one of the reasons that people uh, like Star Trek, is that uh, it, it uh, sort of held out hope for the future, that, uh, that this is what the world is going to be like in the three or four hundred years. Let's hope it is. Well, it's, a, it's very hard to elaborate on something that uh, hasn't been uh, finished writing yet, and we don't even know what uh, it's all about. All I know is that uh, Mr. Roddenberry is uh, at home working on a full-length feature of Star Trek, and uh, they are supposed to have the original cast in it. And uh, But what happens is that uh, he will uh, write his script the way he wants it, and submit it. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> you want to take that one first, Jim? <laughs> What's uh, Scotty to and Sulu's uh, feelings about Mr. Spock? Well, I thought he was a beautifully uh, uh, molded character. And uh, to me, there's no reason at all why... Uh, uh, that's the sort of thing that I'm talking about, is that that sort of person, you know, he may have a bigger head or pointed ears or something like that, or shorter legs, uh, 
but uh, to me, uh, the, the character was so beautifully uh, rounded and, and so beautifully done by uh, Leonard Nimoy, who himself is a gorgeous person. And uh, I think that uh, Leonard uh, tended in the uh, later scripts, though, to have uh, to run more to the Vulcan rather than to the Earth uh, part of his uh, humanity, shall we say. Uh, and uh, began to show uh, no emotion, whereas he should have uh, been able to show emotion and at some time to me, which he did in the uh, like the first 13 or 14, uh, you know, in the first year. He showed some emotion at some times, but then he tended to gradually graduate to more being more of a Vulcan than he did the part Vulcan and part Earth. Uh, there was a question away at the back there, Christine, I think. I never, I never heard of one. <laughs> I think they were all one race up there. Oh, are you pointed ears? I said... Did you ever call him a pointed ear Vulcan, like uh, Doc McCoy? <laughs> oh, I think, uh, no, McCoy did McCoy. quite a bit. I don't think I did. Uh, no, McCoy did. Now, I uh, think uh, Mr. Spock was uh, a fantastic creation and a very significant one, too. Uh, television tends to be very un... Uh, unadventurous. It's a rather conservative medium. And for, first of all, Gene Roddenberry to have been able to conceive and create a character like that, I think it uh, uh, was a, a venturesome thing. And then, as uh, Jimmy said, for uh, Leonard Nimoy to have uh, filled out that character so fully and so interestingly, such you know dimension to the character, I think it's a tribute to Leonard's uh, uh, gifts as an actor. I think, most importantly, what it uh, symbolized for us was the importance for us to have an open mind to all the various forms that uh, uh, life can take, and to also be able to respect that. That was the other thing that, that was important about Star Trek. We had rather bizarre creatures, and I think Leonard, uh, or uh, uh, Spock, the, uh, the character of Spock was one of them. And yet, I think everyone who enjoyed Star Trek came to respect uh, Spock and uh, from some of the fa uh, fan mails that Leonard got, I think some of the women uh, had more than respect for him. <laughs> but for, for that kind of uh, uh, response to have, elicited, to have been elicited from uh, the audience, I think was a significant achievement for television and certainly a tribute to uh, Leonard and uh, Gene Roddenberry. And also, I, I would like to add, because uh, it just came to mind, that I remember Gene telling me that uh, he had quite a fight with uh, Paramount and NBC to uh, putting a character like Spock on. I mean, they said pointed ears? You know, and they really didn't uh, want it. And, uh, and they had uh, also quite a time uh, even deciding on what color of skin he would, he would have. And uh, there were the uh, powers that be of NBC and uh, and, and Paramount. They uh, they didn't want uh, anybody too far out, you know. And they thought pointed ears was uh, was pretty far out. And as George says uh, that the uh, medium is very very conservative, and unfortunately, getting more conservative all the time. And uh, I think we're uh, graduating to uh, a sameness all over. Uh, Every network is doing the same thing. ABC and CBS and NBC is, they're, they're afraid. And why, what they're afraid of, I don't know, because uh, the people, if, uh, if, if things are done right, then people will accept it, you know, like it was done on Star Trek. And uh, Roddenberry had a big fight on his hands to get the character Spock the way he wanted it. Uh, if I understand your question or your statement, uh, are aliens were too close to being humanoids? Is it? Oh, oh, it's hard for us to predict what uh, you know the future uh, depiction of uh, aliens uh, on the show will be like. Uh, if, is that your question? What are they going to be looking like in the future episodes of Star Trek? No, that's, well, that's, uh, that's only because it can be done in animation. You know, there's no way that. It would take, uh, you know, 10 hours of makeup and everything else to uh, do an Arex, uh, you know, in a, uh, in a regular live Star Trek uh, show or movie. Uh, and uh, it is, 
there's no way that they are going to have uh, characters like Arex, uh, you know, in the in the new show. And why they came out with them uh, like that, I don't know. You know, to me that was I just they they told me about it and showed me pictures of it because I do the voice of Arex, and uh, you know, and I just said, no, oh, well, why, why, you know? And they said, oh, well, science fiction, it's science fiction, which is the same, you know. But that's the, I, I don't like that sort of sort of creature. But uh, they want me to do the voice for it, so I do it. <laughs> do we think Kirk's character was, uh, became unbelievable because he always wanted to fall in love and was always uh, falling in love with uh, the women? Uh, uh, personally, uh, I think it was. Uh, I do, I too. I think they should have <laughs> let me do it. <laughs> much <laughs> No, we, uh, we started out, we did 18 uh, animated shows, and uh, for some reason or other, I don't know why, uh, this year they only added another seven, and we have finished doing those. So, um, but that's it, you know. Yes, Helen. What we have enjoyed most about this trip to England? Well, to me, it's just... Uh, meeting all of you and the uh, beautiful organization that Jenny has set up and, uh, and the meeting people that I have corresponded with about this, you know, and it is, uh, it's really a beautiful thing. And also it is to come to Leicester, which I had never been to before. And it's very nice to see. I echo Jimmy's feelings. Uh, I think that's the thing about uh, these conventions that's so good. It's an opportunity for us to meet people that uh, uh, we share a common love, you know, uh, for Star Trek, uh, the things that made it happen, uh, what uh, what's going to happen about it. Uh, I think it's good to get together and talk about that. But the thing, the other thing that I really enjoyed about this visit is uh, was the chance for me to again see how you British live and your lifestyle. You know, I think the British are really a civilized people. <laughs> the, the, they really are polite and and warm and gracious and you know yesterday I went roaming through uh, Leicester and uh, you know I was wa wandering around aimlessly and so I would frequently get lost and uh, I'd like to orient myself so I would ask people uh, for direction and the kind of, uh, of uh, openness and friendliness that was uh, shown me I really was taken by that and so it was a chance for me to re-fall in love with England and that I I'm very uh, appreciative of, of, of and uh, I'll remember very much. Uh, I hold a very warm and fond spot uh, in my heart for England. I want to say that uh, uh, we're going to have to uh, close pretty soon now, but I did want to say that uh, I was 19 when I first came over to England, and it took me a long time to uh, get used to things, but uh, I ended up with a fabulous love for England, and uh, I really, when I travel, uh, it's very nice to see other places, but I feel so terribly at home and comfortable here. And uh, to me, as George has already uh, said, is that uh, to me, London is the greatest city in the world, and you and have more uh, real fun in London and enjoy yourself more than you can, and to me, in any other city in the world. And I've been to some of the other big ones, and uh, they're very nice, some of them, but uh, nothing like London. London has its own thing, you know, and that I think that. The thing that impressed me uh, first about London was um, the fact that for uh, over a thousand years it has been running the commerce of the world, and you know, and that's kind of that's kind of a big thing. Whether you like commerce or not, you know, we have to have it, and uh, it's really quite fabulous. And, uh, and I'd really love to come back any time. Unfortunately, but I would before we all depart, would like you once again to give a great hand to Jenny for all the work she's done. She's really been <laughs>
like Jenny Harding, who did such a wonderful job at the auction this afternoon. And unfortunately, Marion Kennedy, the Vice President, can't be here this afternoon, but I'm sure you will appreciate what she did for the fancy dress and all the rest of it. Jenny's mum, because Jenny's mum's been absolutely a marvel. We wouldn't have been able to do anything without Jenny.